Kirkman. Hey, everybody, welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Kirby. And of course, we talk with people who are going to help our small and medium sized nonprofit do good better. Um, this is an episode that I have been waiting a very long time to talk uh, about uh, and to interview with. Um, short backstory, if you haven't been listening for a very long time, uh, I've been a, a veteran in the fundraising world for nearly two decades, and I got my start, my big boy job uh, was working at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation out of the Twin Cities. And um, for those of you who don't know what CF is, it is a uh, genetic disease uh, that affects really only about 30,000 kids in the, uh, in the United States at one time. And it is, uh, it's mucus buildup in the lungs, the pancreas, and it makes uh, for a very short lifespan. And so I got to work with very few families who were super dedicated because the average life expectancy when I started with them was about 24. And uh, parents would say, where's the research to help us build a drug pipeline? And the government said, we consider you an orphan disease. Therefore, we are not going to dedicate funding to your research. And the parents said, hell no, and we're going to do it ourselves. And they developed this pipeline of a system to do something that they called venture philanthropy. And we're going to talk about that today because when an organization decides that they're going to find a cure because no one else is going to do it, and there is a passionate group of individuals who are going to help make that a reality, this little, little loophole and little trick with some super passionate people taking a lot of money and doing a lot of good in a very niche form is how you get crap done. And I'm stoked to have uh, my guest today, uh, Michael Hunt, who's the CEO of EBResearch.org. Um, we're going to talk about venture philanthropy, but my friend, thank you so much for being a guest here on the official Do Good Better podcast. Hey, Patrick, thank you for having me. I'm a fan, so it's an honor to be here. And look, uh, massive respect, not only for what you've done in your professional career, but given a platform like this to share good work, good stories, and help all of us uh, improve together. The rising tide lifts all ships, right? Uh, uh, 100%, my friend, that is a fact. So uh, for those of you tuning in, and uh, wow, EB Research, I don't I don't know anything about this. Maybe venture philanthropy. I don't know much about this. Uh, why don't we start at a 5,000-foot view, who you are, what you do, and why we're talking today. Absolutely. Well, Patrick, my name is Michael Hunt. I'm CEO of EB Research Partnership. Our big, bold, audacious goal is to cure EB, which stands for epidermolysis bullosa, by the end of this decade, by 2030, and in the process, really lead and pioneer a model that can help the 400 million people with a rare disease, 10% of our planet. And the parallels with CF, it was really interesting to hear you start the show out that way, um, are, are, are very similar. So what is EB? What is epidermolysis bullosa? Similar to CF, rare disease, orphan disease, about 30,000 people in the US, about 500,000 across the world, and it affects the largest organ, the skin. So children with EB are born often with one gene mutation. You and I, we get a scrape, we get a wound, collagen flushes the system and the wound heals. Kids who are born with EB don't have that ability for their skin to heal. So it's very difficult, it's very painful. Many live their life in full body bandages, um, you know, constant doctor's appointments and visits, life expectancy can be one to 30 years old. And that's the challenging part, the optimistic part, and what gives us all hope in the community hope, because it's one gene mutation that we know, we have that target in our sights, right? It gives us a goal and a mission to run towards. And we as an organization fund the most innovative research on the planet, things like gene therapies and protein replacement and exon skipping and gene editing and squamous cell carcinoma treatments and immune therapy, all with that one goal. How do we treat and heal EB. And, you know, so far in the last decade, we've seen remarkable progress. When we started, there was really two clinical trials. There wasn't a lot of hope. There wasn't a lot of science. There wasn't a rallied community. Um, you know, 10 short years later in the field of medical research, we now have 40 clinical trials. We've raised $50 million. We funded more than 120 projects um, across the world. Uh, we, we do it all under venture philanthropy. We've started companies, we fund universities, we fund companies, uh, and it's really led to this remarkable impact today amongst those 40 clinical trials. We have four phase three clinical trials. Some are up for approvals um, this year. So uh, the future is bright. And certainly we, our community and our team wake up every morning ready to run towards those ambitious yet achievable goals. What I love most about uh, this story is the relatability. I mean, I'm having like wonderful flashbacks of conversations that I had, you know, uh, 15 years ago 
uh, when we first heard of this term venture philanthropy. And when we were, uh, you know, young fundraisers sitting on a conference call, not a Zoom call, a conference call, sitting around an actual phone system. And we heard our um, CEO and president say, we are going to invest $750,000 into a no-name company out of Boston, Massachusetts to genetically engineer a cure that is an oral pill that will change a, a mutated gene. We all thought, it was science fiction. And I remember audibly going, oh, come on, man. That's so much more money we have to raise. And the genius about these this niche research is that, you know, you've got this wonderful framework to go by. What made the, the, the realm of venture philanthropy or what made EB such a, a desirable uh, goal of like, hey, in the next decade, we could do this? What made you think as crazy as I remember my CEO doing that? you know, nearly 20 years ago. Yeah, well, it's it's an important place to start, right? What, what was the motivation and, and why do things differently? Why innovate? And, you know, it, it really began with a dedicated group of parents, right? That had children with this, this disease, had children with this disease. And what's the alternative, right? When there's no research being done and there's no funding available for it, uh, you're not going to sit idle, right? And just accept that fate. So it really started with a motivated group of parents saying, we want to change um, this landscape so our child can have a different future, right? Uh, we were really lucky in the founding periods, in addition to the parents, to be joined by remarkable co-founders, Jill and Eddie Vetter, uh, which, you know, are just incredible human beings, philanthropists. Uh, Jill Vetter's best friend, uh, the, the former family, had a child with the disease, and they were really moved by it. So it helps early on when you have a motivated, passionate um, group of parents, but then you also get somebody like the Vetters to join your cause and really elevate the awareness globally. So that was the initial motivation. You know, why venture philanthropy? It's interesting, uh, particularly in rare disease. You know, we were started by a group of, of parents, but many were business leaders. Uh, and we talk about this with CF. Myself, you know, has a nonprofit, but business education and business background. We talk about it all the time. 501c3 is a tax status, not a business model, right? And every cause, every mission on the planet deserves people to think about their nonprofit and their mission work in business terms, right? So, so part of it was just the simple question of why would we raise dollars from our community, fund research, and watch while that research becomes commercialized and we don't share in that economic upside and benefit? That doesn't make sense to a venture capitalist, to an entrepreneur, to an investor. Why should that make sense to a foundation? You know, Patrick, the other learning experience early on was mistakes, right? Making some of those investments in science seeing these big acquisitions from you know, venture capital and biotech and pharma and publicly traded companies and saying, hey, we help lift that out of the lab into the hands of patients. We watch the dollars. Our shareholders are the patients that we serve and represent. Why shouldn't that community benefit from it? So you know, watching that and saying we can be better and that model can be better. The third thing is you know, rare disease is uniquely positioned and the same way EB is and CF you know, we, we talked about how big of a community this is. I mean, there's more people on this planet with a rare disease than cancer and HIV combined, right? And in aggregate as a community, yet individually, these are really small communities, right? Half don't even have foundations. You know, the average time for diagnosis is eight years. Most organizations, now, the rare disease foundations never cross the million dollar threshold, right? There's small groups of people trying to organize these things. Um, so, so when you think about the market opportunity, 400 million people, the rare disease, yet 95% of rare diseases have zero approved treatments, right? That's a problem we're solving and you can do it with good business models. So why is rare disease uniquely positioned, right? If, and, and CF learn, learn from this and at EB, we learn from it, you know, because there's not a lot of capital available, and you mentioned this, right? CF early on, there wasn't government funding available. There's not a lot of people with the disease. So there's not a lot of donors and philanthropists and leaders that take it on, but it benefits venture philanthropy, right? And let me give you an example. If you are a very large disease group and you walk into a university and you say, hey, we're really interested in funding your science, um, but as a condition of our funding, we want to build an equity upside. So if it's ever commercialized, we share in that, the dollars come back to the foundation so we can fund more research and cure the disease. Most times you may be laughed out of the building and, and why? Why do we have to do that? Because we could get other sources of capital from government. We can get other sources of capital from the 20 other foundations just like you. So 
um, you know, thanks, but but uh, we don't we don't need to do that. The the leverage, right, which is back to those business principles of being the only source of capital, allows you to say, look, um, we are the ones willing to fund this, but our expectation is if there's going to be capitalization and a return on investment that we want to share in that, have it go back to the foundations to benefit the, the, the patient community and fund more research and science until we cure this disease. So, you know, it's it's one of those interesting areas where I believe rare diseases are actually better positioned to have really good venture philanthropy models. And we've seen the impact of that, right? Uh, and we've seen the results of that. What I, what I love most about this is, and this is so applicable, if you're a small or medium-sized nonprofit, and you're like, well, you're talking about 50, 60, 70 million dollars worth of stuff. This doesn't apply to me. It absolutely does. Because two things that you said that I love, I, I just love on a hammer on this uh, for the for the smaller groups. One, uh, your tax status is not your business model, right? Act like a business. And I think so many small nonprofits think of themselves as not as worthy of conversations in the room with people who have capacity on on a, on a, a solution to a problem, whether it's community uh, food scarcity, whether it's uh, uh, autism services, whether it's development, whatever that is, you have every right. And actually you probably have better standing with what you're giving back to the community at large than the corporation or the corporate leader that's sitting behind the desk that you're trying to get a meeting with to talk about philanthropy. Can you just talk a little bit about that too? Because the swagger by with small nonprofits who have very niche needs and funding and solutions for it should be at the table with everybody else. And how do you go into a room knowing that you've got a very small group of people that you're trying to help but that, again, I go back to that swagger because you're a nonprofit. You've got to do this work. How do you do that? And and how do you empower somebody who doesn't have the confidence to walk in there um, who should? Yeah, well, perfectly said, Patrick. Uh, you know, how do you have the swagger uh, to be at the table and, in fact, create the table and decide who sits at that, right? And and you said that perfectly. And, and another way to think about that is aligning incentives of the community it takes to get treatments to market and get diseases approved, right? So I, I love that metaphor of sitting at the table, right? So who should be at the table? You know, first and foremost, true north, the most important thing, patients, families, their voices matter most, right? That's who we serve, all right? And, and, and oftentimes their insights are beyond any publication or scientific study or, you know, biotech and pharma's objectives in a clinical trial, like, like really, really starts with them. And, and foundations represent those patients. So you've got to have the patient voices first and foremost in the room. Then, you know, who else? Academic medical centers and scientists and researchers across the planet, right? They are doing the work. They are doing the science. They're in those labs every single day trying to find breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. And then once you get those breakthroughs, how do you get those to market and in, into the hands of patients from the bench to the bedside, right? How do you accelerate that process. And in rare disease, you often see this valley of death, right? Things get stalled or slowed in a lab or not capitalized and they sit there, right? They, they don't get into clinical trials. So who else do you need at the table? You need the biotech and pharmaceutical companies that are going to bring those things to market and get them in the hands of patients, right? So if, if you start there and you start to think about it, how do you align incentives? Well, you've got foundations and patient communities that are willing to raise some dollars, right? And direct it towards academic medical centers, doing the science, doing the innovative work in the labs, that science never leaves unless there's interest from biotech and pharma. And it's so fascinating with venture philanthropy, particularly for rare diseases, you almost can think of it as de-risking early stage investments, almost like what an angel investor would do, right? right. And what yeah. do we mean by that? The biotech and pharma aren't going to invent in bench science in a lab for a rare disease, right? There's no addressable market. They have other funding priorities. So if foundations like ours via venture philanthropy can de-risk that, get it to a point of, let's say, a preclinical phase or even a phase one clinical trial, now you've made that appetizing and appealing for biotech and pharma. You've de-risked that. You've proved out the science. You've made it fundable, really, at that point, right? So you're helping the academics by funding their science. You're helping the academics by getting their science to a point where it can be moved forward by biotech and pharma. And then you create win-win scenarios, right? That's aligning the incentives. The foundations fund the work in the lab. The scientists are able to do that work and develop it and get it to a point of commercialization. The companies now have this portfolio. You're almost running R&D in addition to de-risking the early stage investments and then can carry it forward. 
the key through line of all of that is venture philanthropy, right? If, if we're going to start that chain and process, if those companies are going to go and, you know, take it to market and see significant revenue from that, return on investment, ROI is return on impact, you know, return on investment, dollars back to us so we can fund more research and continue the cycle until we cure the disease, right? Now you've created massive amounts of impact that grow and grow and ripple and ripple so we can fund more researchers and scientists. So more companies are incentivized to come in the space. So, uh, you know, in summary, I love that you started that who deserves to be at the table or who should be at the table, because that's the way all nonprofits should really think about it. How do we align incentives? You know, and, and a lot of that, there's synergy, right? I think, I think patients want to see treatments brought to market. So do academics and so do companies. The paths may be slightly different. So how do we align that to make sure we can get everybody on the same path and the same road moving forward? The other thing that I really like about that whole um hear hear your partners watching all of this stuff grow is that I guarantee in this scenario, other organizations, other rare diseases impacted positively by the research being done. And, and I remember distinctly in the CF world that there were so many offshoots of research that happened because of the investment that they made. It was like, oh, we could actually take this disease, this, and they use the same techniques, get funding for it in this in a very similar manner and have just as positive results um, out, of, out of clinical trial because they were using the same techniques of funding and the same uh, of, of research, et cetera, which I, that's, that's another benefit. So as a donor, you know, you only, or an investor, let's just say, or, you have, or a donor, both of them, you not only get to make an EB impact, but the subsequent research that's done from the process or the framework by which they're doing research is helping other diseases. And so you get to go back and say, hey, by the way, your $100,000 gift did this, this, and this in our uh, in EB research, and we pushed the limits. But you know what's really interesting? Your investment also paved the way for this, this, and this. You've quadrupled your impact from your one gift because you gave us the opportunity to do good work and research as a whole. What a fun story to actually go tell because that's going to excite them to go and give more all the time. Yeah. And that, you know, that, that is such an important point of what does it mean to the donor? What does it mean to the patient? I'll give you a couple specific examples. You know, a, a few years ago, we had funded a gene therapy project at a West Coast university and, um, you know, put, put the dollars in, it was about half a million dollars, right. And built in a venture philanthropy model, right? So if this succeeds, there's dollars back to the university, there's dollars back to the foundation. Just a few short years after we funded that at a university, a public traded company came in and acquired that uh, science, that IP to take it into a phase one clinical trial. At that point, EB Research Partnership as a foundation received, received shares in the company that we turned into cash to fund research that totaled $3 million, right? So, so what's the result of that? Uh, to your point, we were able to fund a, a really, really impactful project for patients, right? We put $500,000 in. We helped the university get to a point of acquisition from a publicly traded company. We took $500,000 and created $3 million, a 6X return that goes back to the foundation to continue to fund more research. And to your point, then allows us to expand that, right? Now, it's not just that one university. We have funding for five more universities, right? And today, Patrick, that exact use case, that is one of the phase three clinical trials that is looking for FDA approval in the near future, right? So in the end, what was accomplished? Number one, we took something in a lab. Now it's actually looking at being one of the first treatments approved in the United States for EB. Number two, you know, we helped that university have the funding to, to make it appealing to a company to come in and acquire it, take it out of a lab, get into clinical trials and move it forward. And number three, you know, as you said, if you're a donor and you gave me one dollar, I helped advance science at to a, you know into the hands of patients and clinical trials. Now looking at approval, yep. so objective accomplished with your dollar. But I also took your one dollar and I turned it into six dollars, right? So, so that's really the specifics of how it can work. I and I and this is where I think again, bringing it back down to that small nonprofit. Well, I don't know. I'm a, I don't even have government research. I don't have this and this, but you do have impact. So when you're thinking about, let's get, again, community food scarcity, you're not thinking about global food insecurity. You're not thinking about how can I impact the entire country? You're thinking about, I got a 12 block radius of individual families who are really suffering that needlessly. And so we're going to solve that problem. 
you go to a donor, you say, invest in us at a thousand dollars, and we're able to solve not only a, a, a bit of food insecurity in these neighborhoods, but the mental health of the kids who don't have to worry about where their food's going to come or the parents' sense of relief that they don't have to worry about X, Y, and Z that trickles down to the kids so there's not this generational trauma piece. You can directly tie all of this the same way that Michael is talking about how university systems are taking their research or whatever. And it, and it requires you to ask a couple of questions. What, what good did this do in the community for those that got served, right? And you're going back to your donors and saying, I took your $1,000 and I made $6,000 worth of impact. And I just want to let you know that that wouldn't have happened without you. Well, that's the same mindset of a venture philanthropist at a micro scale in, in what you're, you've been given in this past 25 minutes of conversation, the roadmap on how to absolutely do it. One of the things I want to return to, though, and you've mentioned it twice, maybe even three times at this moment, is the thing that we talk a lot about on this podcast with a number of different people is alignment. There are probably businesses or individuals or even research companies that are taking a look at EB and saying, not interested. But they're probably the ones that you find that say, I'm super interested. How important is it? Maybe this is part of your mistake uh, part where you're investing, uh, you know, uh, not as, as, as well or didn't turn out as well as it possible. But how important is it alignment wise and how OK is it for someone to say no? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a really important point. And I think that alignment has everything to do with partnerships. Right. And that could be the, the partners that you bring on your board, the teams and staff that you built the donors, right? And sometimes saying yes and saying no to understand if, if those partnerships and incentives and, and really mission and ethos are aligned. And to your question, it's exactly the same in the biotech and pharma space. And, and you couldn't be more accurate when you said that was a lesson learned from mistakes really early on. And it's a perfect example of what you're asking. You know, uh, we had funded a project, you know, help advance it to a point where a small biotech company then took it forward it was, a, and this was before we did venture philanthropy. This is probably one of the biggest learning experiences of why you should do venture philanthropy. So in addition, we missed out on the economic upside of work that we funded. We've talked about that, but now you're raising another point, right? Which is time. Time is the greatest assets for families that battle a rare disease, right? It's the greatest asset. You don't get any more of it. And it's what we all fight for to give back time to these children that battle this disease. So time is important, right? And in this specific example, uh, that treatment had been acquired by a very large pharmaceutical company, right? And, you know, th this is um, just sort of the way that this happens. They have a lot of R&D. They have a lot of projects. Sometimes things become prioritized or deprioritized. In this case, that treatment was deprioritized and sat on a shelf for a long period of time. So now we had funded something. We had helped advance it, which is the per first part of the goal. But there it sits. And you don't have any ability to do that. So, you know, from those lessons learned, what are some key principles of venture philanthropy? Coming up with an economic equation that not only works for the foundation and patients, but works for the university, but works for the company, right? And, and that's math and economics and business, but that's really important. Number two, some way to have influence or an ability to have a say over what happens with that science that you fund. So for example, one of the provisions we have now is time, right? If that sits for a certain amount of time, the foundation has the ability to step back in, to mark back in, pull that out and move it forward, right? And then, you know, number three is really finding those right partners and having the ability to do that, right? It's not just capital. And that's actually what makes venture philanthropy very different than just traditional VC, to your point. Traditional VC, you can have a mission, you can have a focus, but at the end of the day, you've got GPs and LPs that want to get their return on money, and that tends to be a primary motivator, right? Well, what's different here is you're making that a secondary motivator, right? Number one is find good partners good actors, good science, good treatments, the things that are going to benefit most and be most impactful towards patients that battle EB and other rare diseases as in, you know, really, really priority number one, then priority number two, sure, you know, we want to, we want to yeah. find a way to get some return on investment, return on impact, right? But, but that changes the equation a little bit. And what that allows you to do is prioritize finding those good partners, prior, prioritizing the best science, sometimes taking more risk, right? If you're a traditional VC, you might go for the safer bet that provides, you know, let's say an EB, a little bit of wound healing, you know, bigger addressable market size. 
is safe, you know, but holding that true north is what's best for the patients, you right. know, allows us to take more risks and say, well, hey, look, we want the moonshots. We want those things that are going to be definitive and curative, right? Um, and, and really put them towards the front of the prioritization. You know, a part of that too is it's taking the risk. And I think a lot of nonprofits, especially small, medium-sized ones, don't want to make a mistake because they don't know what the consequences are thereof. Can you talk a little bit about um, not only, I mean, you learned the lesson from it, you should have done X, Y, and Z, but the importance of trying and not sitting on your hands. Because I think there's an element of that time piece that the the risk of doing nothing is way worse than than trying something. And, and a lot of nonprofits are so risk adverse now because they don't want to offend somebody or worry about a donor that they just are frozen in time. And if you can give a bit of maybe context to like what sitting on your hands could mean for, you know, some of the research and some of the stuff that maybe someone can attribute to like, well, you know what, maybe making that phone call or maybe making that investment or maybe doing that activity or event is something I should do, even though it might not have the end result we're looking for. It's going to help us lesson learned. Yeah. I'll give you a couple examples, Patrick. And in some applied to venture philanthropy, some are far beyond it. I mean, you know, for venture philanthropy, you know, how do you really make decisions and, you know, de-risk things, but also at the same time be incentivized to take right. risks, right? To have that innovative mind, mindset, you know, to take those moonshots, to think bold. You know, part of it is, again, another business principle, you know, balancing your portfolio, right? So it's not all in one place and all in the other. So what does that mean really specifically for us? You know, there's times where an EB, the biggest thing, and we all think is going to deliver that that cure for us is gene editing and gene therapies. Well, that's great, but don't put all your focus in that one area because every financial advisor, or venture capitalist, or private equity would say that is dangerous, right? To focus in that area. So I think a big part of it is balancing your portfolio. Look, last year alone in 2022, we had a record year. We funded 6.6 million in research for 19 projects in six different countries. And it was the most diverse portfolio we've ever funded. Yeah, the gene therapies and gene editing were there. There was curative treatments. You know, you talked about science fiction becoming science, Patrick. We're funding, you know, curative science, uh, things like gene editing of iPS cells that create new sheets of skin or delivered via spray on skin, right? That sounds like something out of a movie, but, but that's not science fiction, that's scientific certainty. So you have those big moonshots, but then we also funded squamous cell carcinoma projects and immune therapy. You know, one of squamous cell carcinoma is derivative of, um, of epidermal lysis bullosa, right? Being a skin disease. We funded protein replacement therapies. We funded, um, uh, you know, antibodies in the same way that we look at vac vaccines. We funded exon skipping. So I think part of it is really thinking about balancing your portfolio so you have the comfort and ability to take some of those big moonshots and risks but know that there's that baseline of, of treatments uh, that you're going to fund that maybe are a little bit more de-risk. Number two, you know, and this again goes back to innovative business principles, we serve patients. They don't have time. Every day they wake up and spend hours doing full body, full body bandages, bleach baths, a string of doctor's appointments. Every day is urgent. Every day is important. And, and our team and our board, we carry that urgency with us. So you apply that to your organization. So we talked about venture philanthropy. How does that apply to fundraising? You know, during the pandemic 2022, and, and I've heard a lot of your shows addressing this, you know, I think there was a lot of silver linings, right? Uh, as part of a pandemic. One example for us is um, pandemic happens. A lot of organizations raise money, you know, via galas and walks and runs and all these things. Well, all of a sudden that was wiped out. What do you do? Do patients back down and run away from this every day? No. So, so we ought not either, right? And really think about how we push and move past those barriers. So, you know, I started talking to Jill and Ed Vetter, and we said, look, we have to do something, right? We have to do something for these families. Let's brain some, brainstorm some ideas. So we said, well, what about, you know, it, you know, obviously Ed has this massive platform as a musician in that world. What if we got a couple musicians and a couple actors together and we just did some digital video, right? And we told some stories of the families. We told some stories of the medical community and it just started of this concept. Maybe we'll do a couple of videos and try to do a fundraiser. You know, by November of that year, the pandemic starting in March, we launched a digital event, right? An hour long event that was seen by more than a million people. Uh, you know, we were joined by everybody from David Letterman to Bradley Cooper to Laura Dern to John Batiste to, to Billie Eilish, you know, all these people because they're home, right, doing what we're doing now in front of Zooms and cameras contributed their voices to this platform in the same way that families did. So 
you know, we used to do galas in a room with a few hundred people. Now we just brought this rare disease uh, to over a million people. And the first year it raised over $2 million, more than double any fundraiser we've done. Uh, we now completed our third year of doing it. The show is called Venture into Cures this year. It's free to the world, right? But then you raise money on sponsorships. You inspire people to hear those stories. And we've had everybody from Tom Holland to Zendaya to Olivia Rodrigo to Ed Sheeran, um, you know, to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, just really these people stand up for the cause and what's been accomplished. We've raised over $6 million in the last three years, and we've introduced the mission to over, you know, to, to millions of people and created beautiful content of what it's like for these families and how brave and courageous they are and what it's like for the medical community. So that's an innovation, right? If we didn't think big and take that risk, and try something and not be afraid to fail, you know, that not only is the biggest fundraiser that's ever happened for EB, but we're told the biggest fundraiser for, for rare disease at large, right? And so all the benefits of doing something like that, you know, th these are the risks um, that you have to take that, that patients and families deserve. I love, and again, I, that's what I love most about this industry and the entire nonprofit sector is I think most know that who they're serving or what they're doing isn't going to take a break, right? And I, I think that's where we all get together and go, okay, deep breath, let's figure it out. We're the most resilient sector in this entire uh, global economy. We're the ones that step up and think way outside of the box to think creatively and use art and culture and things to like come together and, and sort of uh, create something cool and different and new because we have to. Because those that we're serving don't have the luxury of not doing it, and I, and I love that that sort of again that business mindset in that venture venture philanthropy piece of saying like listen don't put all of your eggs into one thing. Same thing if you're a small nonprofit, don't only do an event, do an event and appeal and and, and asks this right. So spread that what's going to work, and then you double down on those kind of things, right? So don't always uh, you know sort of concentrate on that ah thing, because that's not going to help. Um, and it's also going to limit the amount of people that you have access to, or they limit uh, the amount of people that you ask as well. And I think that's just one of the coolest things uh, in the entire world. Okay. I, I know we're coming up against time. Honestly, I think I need like a five hour podcast. I need a Joe Rogan style length in order to get us again back in the same uh, vicinity. Cause it's just fascinating stuff, my friend. And I'm so glad and appreciative of your time. Um, what kind of is my final uh, particular question is what is the, the, the future of, um, venture philanthropy fundraising or this very niche sort of, um, you know, rare disease fundraising? What do you think the future becomes? Maybe if it's scientific, maybe it's fundraising, but what are the things that you're seeing on the horizon that, again, like I said, was going to be science fiction that's a reality now, uh, but what are you seeing and sensing and kind of forecasting for the near future on, on where a lot of these individuals who might not have had a voice a number of years ago have one now? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, Patrick, I, there's 7,000 rare diseases at least, right? And I would love to see nearly every single one of them with great business models and employing things mm -hmm. like venture philanthropy, right? It, it, that, that would be the magic wand and the wish uh, to, to really see that, you know, and, and to think in an innovative way, to think about what other industries do, you know, from an investment perspective, even good design, right? You know, so you can communicate your mission in a way that all can understand and be motivated by Um you know, to think about technology and the use of technology, right? We're building a big data platform in collaboration with Stanford and Amazon Web Services. We just won an award from MIT, right? To really think about, um, you know, uh, how you can innovate on all aspects of your business. I mean, number two, with venture philanthropy, I talk all the time to foundations that are either just getting starting or they want to evolve. I, I, you know, cystic fibrosis, as you said, deserves credit for really inventing this, right? What EB Research Partnership has done is pioneered venture philanthropy as a principle. And I would, I would love to see that in the future of organizations where this isn't something that we try from time to time. I mean, we haven't put a dollar out the door in 10 years without a venture philanthropy model in place. So I would love to see that in the same way that stewarding donors or um, you know, having a good bylaws for an organization, that it's the same thing. Like, this is what we do, this is how it's done. You know, number three, really working hand in hand with universities and companies, right? I mean, that sounds so simple, but it's not something that's done enough so we can understand what those aligned incentives are to create models around it. You know, that's that's how you start. Too often, all these disparate groups run in different directions, but there's so much opportunity to collaborate. 
and really understand, you know, how our work can complement one, one another, because we all share that, that same goal and understanding it. And I would say the fourth is applying investment principles. And honestly, we are growing and learning here. We are not experts. You know, we've done the research funding. Even if you look at the 40 clinical trials, we've directly funded more than half, right? So we've created a market, but I think the next step that we look at, and I'd like to see all organizations get to, it's okay. You know, we funded, you know, more than 120 projects. We've raised $50 million, but now taking that next step that a biotech VC would and say, okay, looking at those projects specifically, where are the synergies? Have we funded enough gene therapy? How can we take, you know, this project we funded in California and, you know, interface them with the project in Germany and really figure out how they can, they can work with one another. You know, the same thing you would do as a venture capital fund and find synergies in your portfolio. So we're not even to that point yet, but a couple of years from now, I'd really love to see people doing that. And then number five, finally, which in some ways has to do with venture philanthropy, how can you have technology unite and accelerate, right? So the platform that we've built is really a way for patients to have curated their journey with a disease, right? So it's driven by patients. Patients are in the driver's seat. They decide and have ownership over where their data goes, whether it goes to a university or a company winning a clinical trial. But, you know, we are at the advent of breakthroughs in medical research and science, and we're seeing it today. You know, gene editing is a technology, right, that's scalable. So how can we look at things like large-scale genomic analysis? You know, really, I I'm a Kansas country boy, right? So how do you lead the horse to water? Leveraging technology as a way to set that table you mentioned earlier. You know, we've got a willing group of patients that want to participate in clinical trials and contribute to research. There, some of them are willing to share their genomics and journey with the disease. You know, that can shave years off of getting treatments approved if we can leverage technology in that way. So just a couple, a couple of things, like I agree with you, we could talk for five hours, but a couple of things I think that would benefit all nonprofits, even outside of healthcare to really think about. I think when people listen back to the show, and I think when they you know listen to it once or twice, because you can totally do that, by the way, I, I think you can do that. Um, I think they're going to take so many lessons on on you know that philosophy of like taking some of these elements and how do I apply this locally in my community, my small nonprofit, my medium sized one, and for those who are big or listening to this one too, having the audacity to use these principles as part of your. I'm going to figure out a way to get this done mentality. This, you know, whatever niche you're in, whatever uh, thing you're trying to accomplish, this is really one of the the best and, and most awesome ways to think differently about how you're going to fundraise, uh, interact with with donors, and 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 really try to get your base stoked. Because that's a, that's the other thing too. The the enthusiasm that this this breeds is immeasurable. Because everybody who is now affected by EB or CF or whatever is watching in real time going from zero to 60. And they're like, okay, that tracking the extensive research and, and wins that you're getting is giving them enough inner hope and enough sort of uh, personal stamina to kind of continue on and wait this out. And that strength, I think, is is something that is also unique to something like your organization, which you've now given them in the form of super nerdy scientific documents and research. I mean, that's really another gift that I bet you don't think about on a regular basis, but it's true. You're motivating them by doing this work. Say, I'm going to go and fight a little harder for myself because I know that this is coming down the pipeline. And that, I think, is one of the most unique and awesome things that I got to discuss uh, with you today, my friend. I really appreciate it. I know there are a lot of people who are going to go, okay, how do I find out more about what they're doing? How do I take what they're doing and 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 replicate it? And how do I do some digging and research on all the cool things that you are doing at EB Research? Where do they find you? How do they get a hold of you? And where do they go to uh, bathe in this awesomeness that is venture philanthropy that you talked about today? Well, uh, join us and learn more, www.ebresearch.org. Follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Okay. Uh, and we look forward to many people joining our community. It's going to be great. Uh, when you sit on a sack of money and you're just hiding it, uh, go give it to them. I mean, this is part of the adventure too. You should. Um, I can't thank you enough for what you are doing. Uh, again, as you know, growing up in the fundraising world, 
you know, do, working on, you know, sort of this rare disease that nobody else cared about except for the families that were doing it. Um, this has been brought back all the best memories that I had as a fundraiser getting started. So I can't thank you enough for that. Uh, thanks for what you're doing is to continuing pedal to the metal research and, and sort of adventure philanthropy style. I just love that. But mostly thank you, my friend, for being a guest here on the official Do Good Better podcast. Figure out all the links uh, please follow them, do that. And if you haven't uh, signed up for the show, you should but, uh, subscribe to this. This is good stuff. Um, and then go and click on uh, EV Research and go find out how you can help and, and be a supporter and be a cheerleader the way that everyone else is. We'll see you next time here on the show. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate you being a guest today. Thank you, Patrick. You're the best.